Welcome to this lecture on osteoporosis. In this lecture, we'll cover what is osteoporosis, what are the common risk factors and pathophysiology associated with osteoporosis, what are the common complications associated with osteoporosis, and then finally, very briefly, we'll look at how is it diagnosed, how is it treated. So osteoporosis is a term, it's a compound word, where osteo refers to bone, porosis, pores. Simply, it just means our bones become weakened. Let's have a quick look at this particular diagram. It's a typical bone, and with all bones, they have an outer covering. This outer covering is known as compact bone. This compact bone is very dense bone tissue, which means it's strong, provides structural integrity, but most importantly, it stops compressive forces. Now, deeper to compact bone, which you can see in red, is spongy bone. This is less dense. It has almost these little holes all the way through it, which makes it look like a sponge. And this is why it's called spongy bone. But this tissue also allows for flexibility and strength, but without the weight associated, or as we found with a compact bone. Now, when we look at bone, I kind of think of it like a, a brick house. We kind of think it's made, it's there, it's providing the support, it doesn't do much else. But in fact, it's a very dynamic tissue which means it's constantly being turned over. This, this term is known as remodeling. And actually, this, would pro this bone would probably remodel between four to 10 years. So the whole thing is re reabsorbed and added back between four to 10 years. This is known as remodeling, which is a balancing act between taking bone away, which we call bone resorption, and adding new bone. Now, the cells that take bone away is they're known as osteoclasts. Now these are kind of like macrophages that take, that eat away and take bone or reabsorb bone. Whereas bone cells that add new bone are known as osteoblasts. So it's a balancing act between these two to keep this bone model remodeling process going. Now, in our early ages of life, so child, adolescence, the actual osteoblasts win. So we see more bone being formed, which actually leads to the bone mass or our bone mass being peaked. So we call this peak bone mass at the ages of about 20 to 29 years. So that means we have the strongest bones in this age. So after this age, peak bone max starts to drop off and we actually see approximately 0.7% dropping away each year. That means the osteoclasts become more active after the 29 years in comparison to the osteoblasts. So what kind of things in the early phases allow the osteoblast to be more active? Well, probably the most important one are hormones. So the hormones that we see that have the greatest effect on osteoblast activity would be estrogens, more dominant in females, testosterone more so in males, and growth hormone for both. So these hormones which are higher in these periods would allow this cell to be more active in that phase. Other things is diet, specifically calcium. So calcium, high amounts of calcium will activate, will greater, greater activity for the osteoblasts. And remember vitamin D increases calcium, so those two kind of go hand in hand. So diet is also important for that peak bone mass. Other things that are important is physical activity, specifically loading physical activities. This is like um, putting your bones under stress, like resistance training. So this is an important physical activity to generate the osteoblast activity. Now these things feed into the peak bone mass. So if we don't have these things working or it's slightly reduced, we actually see we have a lower peak bone mass, which then would predispose someone to osteoporosis. Now with the peak bone mass, because of the hormonal difference, males will have slightly higher peak bone mass than females. So that's important to know why females will be at higher risk of osteoporosis. It's actually at five to one. So five females to one male, and that's probably due largely because of the hormone. Now, other risk factors that come in to leading to osteoporosis, I'm gonna discuss now, but before I do that, it's just important to note, there are two, two types of osteoporosis. We have primary osteoporosis 
and secondary osteoporosis. Primary osteoporosis is broken into further two parts. We have age-related or senile um, osteoporosis and sex-related or postmenopausal osteoporosis. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the hormones in a second. The other type of osteoporosis is secondary. That means you have a disease and osteoporosis is secondary to this disease. Now, some of the causes of this would be drugs. So the most common drugs that can lead to osteoporosis would be corticosteroids, proton pump inhibitors, some anti-seizure medications, and heparin. They're the most common. Smoking and alcohol also can lead to that as well. Other causes of secondary um, Osteoporosis would be endocrinal disorders like too much cortisol, too much thyroid hormone, too much parathyroid hormone, or a drop in some of the gonadal hormones like estrogen, testosterone. Some cancers can also lead to osteoporosis like multiple melomas. But we're going to focus on, for the rest of this lecture, on specifically the age-related or senile and um, postmenopausal, which are the primary causes. So now let's look at how these risk factors feed into the pathophysiology of osteoporosis. Starting with age. Well, as we said, uh, after the age of 29 years, the osteoblast activity starts to drop in relative to the osteoclast. So this becomes more dominant. So age, what will happen is age effects is the osteoblast number and activity will start to drop away. That means bone formation will start to decrease. Another big factor which is important is estrogen levels. And this is for the primary osteoporosis being postmenopausal osteoporosis. So estrogen actually has a trophic effect to osteoblasts, but also increasing or holding number. So as, ostrogen, as estrogen starts to drop away after menopause, the actual effect of this will start to diminish to a point where we lose 2% of compact bone per year and 9% of spongy bone per year. And this is why up to 40% of all females will have some degree of osteoporosis. So estrogen having a huge effect for osteoblasts, but also as the estrogen effect starts to drop away, low estrogen will actually cause the osteoclast activity to start increasing. So that would be age and the, the sex effect. Physical activity, we'll also see a drop in physical activity as we age. So a drop in physical activity will, will actually make the osteoblast activity less. Therefore, we have a decrease in bone formation. So that's the physical activity. Diet and, or diet, this would be calcium, and vitamin D. Also, these things start to diminish in our diets as we age. So that means bone formation also decrease. Drugs we spoke about, but I'll just add one important one. Corticosteroids, which we see used for um, decreasing the immune response in some autoimmune conditions or asthma, etc. So corticosteroids would actually increase the activity of osteoclast. That means we have an increase in bone reabsorption. And then finally, genetics. Well, this goes back to the peak bone mass in our earlier phases of life. So it seems that um, Caucasians and Asians have a lower peak bone mass compared to, say, Africans. So that's important for predisposing one to osteoporosis. So from a decrease in bone formation and an increased reabsorption as we get older, what that will do is decrease bone mass. And by doing that, we have a decrease in bone strength. Now, what happens is we start to see greater holes or spaces, particularly in the medullary bone or the spongy bone, which is why it's called porosis. So this, with a thinning of the compact bone, is the most common changes that we see histologically in bones with osteoporosis. So this is then gonna predispose us to fractures. The most common fracture location is the vertebra. Second to that is the neck of femur. Then we see wrist and ribs thereafter. Now it's important to note that the diagnosis for osteoporosis is where we have a reduction in peak bone mass by 
at least 2.5 standard deviations away from the average. So this would be the diagnostic objective point that would allow a diagnosis of osteoporosis. How do we measure the peak bone mass? Well, uh, we can't just do it on a standard x-ray, so we have to do a special x-ray, which we call a DEXA. And this is a dual energy x-ray densiometer. We can also use a quantitative CT, but essentially these two will just look at the density of our bone. Finally, how is it treated? How is it managed? How is it prevented? Well, um, we want to ensure that our calcium and vitamin D levels are adequate, adequate. We want to ensure that we do the right physical activity. Other things that we could do is use drugs to decrease the reabsorption of bone. These are bisphosphonates. What they do is they decrease the activity, but also they can cause apoptosis of osteoclasts. We can also use some immunotherapies, so monoclonal antibodies, which stops the stimulation of osteoclasts. Or we can come across, and for females particularly, we can do some estrogen therapies. So hopefully now you've got a better insight into what osteoporosis is, what it is, pathophysiology, risk factors, how is it diagnosed, and finally treated.